So um, I'm going to be giving a talk on team craftsmanship and really what it means to put people first. This is Steve Blank. He was one of the leaders of the Lean Startup movement. And he has a quote, the best ideas in the hands of a B team is worse than a B idea in the hands of a world class team. And I've heard this in different forms. Sometimes when you talk with venture capitalists, they say something more like, you know, a B idea with an A team is an A, an A idea with a B team is a C. So for the more engineer-minded people in the room, it's about like that. So the team is greater than the idea. You can start out with a great team and a bad idea, and you can probably still succeed. So then the question becomes, how do you build an A team? It's not really like building a, well, so if you go to build a product or design a product, you can't just build it, figure out what you think the customers want, launch it, get it out there. No, it, 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 there's more to it, and I'm sure you all know that. There's users you need to listen to. There's customers you need to listen to. You need to nurture them. And building a good team is in the same way. It's not just about hiring a bunch of smart people. You have to nurture them. Um, why is that important? Well, we've all probably been in bad work environments, maybe where we haven't been listened to, where our opinion maybe doesn't matter that much, where we don't have the independence we want, or we're not appreciated. And if we're doing our most creative work, we're really putting ourselves out there. And we hope, hopefully, somebody has our back, and we're getting the advice we need to thrive. But there's a lot of bad work environments out there. Um, there's this quote, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place. So when it comes back to teams and building effective teams, so much of it comes back to being able to communicate and be open and honest. And it was back in 2009 um, I had figured out how to do some consulting work. I was a, you know, I'm a programmer by trade, learned this hot new language called Ruby on Rails and went to lots of conferences and spoke on it. And I made lots of friends that were also doing that. And it was around 2009 where some of these really talented guys started putting together amazing development shops. There was Hashrocket in Jacksonville. There was um, Pivotal Labs in San Francisco and around the world now. And um, also it's a ThoughtBot in Boston. And those guys um, started building these amazing work environments where they had these, they, they just a bunch of contractors got together, started hanging out together and doing work together. And I was really envious. I was really like looking at that going, I, that's really cool. I wanna create something like that, maybe in Orlando. And at the time I was running the Ruby users group and through running the Ruby users group, I knew of a lot of developers who I wanted to work with. So I sent a bunch of them an email. It all started with an email that went something like this. Oops, a little too quick. What would, your optimal, what would be your optimal work environment? And what does that look like? And I got back an email. And what I didn't realize I was doing there is I was planting the seed for what would become a really amazing work environment where we put people first. And that grew through Envy Labs as a consultancy and then on to Code School as a place for programmers and designers and entrepreneurs go to learn about code and technology. And so I ended up, I left Code School about six months ago. That's a whole other story which I won't be telling today. It's all very good and positive. Um, but while I was there, I mean, we got up to about 50 people and we had the most amazing office environment. So in this talk, I'm gonna be giving you guys 
22 principles that you can do, whether you're creating your own business or whether you're part of a small part of a big business. Hopefully these are some of these things you can take away and bring back to your work environment to help improve the team. And what do you do to improve the team? You put people first. So here's 22 ways that you can do that. In my opinion, everything starts, the most important thing, if you take one thing away from this talk, it's the importance of doing one-on-ones and getting the time with your boss, with your coworkers, to speak. Why is that? One-on-ones should be a time where you get to sit down with your boss and speak openly and freely, and they should provide lots of white space so you can be listened to. Questions should be asked like, what have you really enjoyed working on? What haven't you enjoyed working on? Where do you want to be three months from now? How can I get, help you get there? So just out of curiosity, who here has a one-on-one -on -one with their boss every, at least every month? Who here would love to have that one-on-one -on -one with their boss at least every month? Right, out there too. So that was probably the one thing that I, at one point I was doing like 20 one-on-ones at uh, Envy at one point. Um, but I knew they were really important to talk to people. And it's not just about talking about work. This is also your opportunity to learn and, and, and make friends. So this is the opportunity to say, how are your kids doing? Or, um, you know, oh, you know, I remember you had to go out of town, your grandfather was sick, how, how is he doing? So it's about building that friendship. What is that? And why is that important? A lot of people don't realize why small talk is so important. Small talk is actually really important because of what it does when you can have open conversations is it's building trust. And a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you for the rest of this presentation doesn't work without trust. And you'll see why. All right. So the next step is giving effective guidance. And I think it's Kim Scott from Google does this great talk about, I think it's radical transparency, I think is the name of her talk. And in it, she has this graph, which I thought was really smart. And so guidance usually can be somewhere on this graph. So, but what does this mean really? Well, oh, let me give you an example. So um, about, how long ago? Jeez, maybe 13 years ago. I was working at a company in San Diego called mb3.com. And uh, it was where I learned Perl and command line and shell and grep and awk and pipe and all this sort of stuff. Um, but uh, I was in, in the data warehouse group and I had to do a lot of data crunching. And every week I would end up with some problem where I would get stuck. No matter how much I read the manual, I get so frustrated because I couldn't figure out how to take the data, put it into one space so I could get it into the database. Luckily, there was one guy, let's call him Tim, and I can very vividly remember going into Tim's office. I would slowly open the door, creep around the corner, try to be quiet, and if you can imagine sort of this, you know, he's got the four monitors practically in like a dark den, you know, little lighting, crunched over his monitor, and he would see that I came in and kind of finish up what he was doing, and with sort of the dead pan on his face, look back at me as if I was the just, you know, interrupting him out of something important. And it was really clear that he did not really care that much because I could see it all over his face. And I would say, hey, Tim, I have this problem about blah, blah, blah. Can you help me? And he'd go, yeah. And uh, he could always solve my problem. He always knew the answer, but I always ended up feeling like, why does he hate me when I leave his office? So. Very clear, he could solve my problems quickly, but really did not care. That kind of sucks. So great clarity, but made me feel like he didn't care. In the bottom left, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, this is the asshole boss. <laughs> this is the boss that basically says, yeah, what you turned in, it wasn't good enough, you're gonna have to do better next week. Does not care and does not give you any clear feedback. In the bottom right, 
can also be very dangerous. This is where you end up working with people who care a lot about you, but maybe care so much they don't want to hurt your feelings. And so maybe they'll give you a compliment sandwich. Oh, it's that what you did was so great and blah, 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 and A and B and C is great. Could you just, it's not a big deal. Could you just please just, you can just take this color from maybe a little bit darker red if you want, please. But really, the rest is great, and I'm sure they're going to love it. Right. So like, oh, so much uh, like indirect communication. Um, so right, so the, but really too nice to give you the direct, the effective guidance that you want. This can be really dangerous, by the way. I don't know, I've had, the, this is where you get called into the office one day and like get laid off because somebody didn't have the courage to tell you and give you the guidance you needed to succeed. That can also be really dangerous. So you wanna be up here. You wanna make sure you're in an environment where it can be really caring and really clarity. Now just because it's high caring doesn't mean it's not difficult to hear. In this sort of quadrant, it might be hard to hear, but you know it comes from a good place, so it might be direct. Like, I need you to make this red a darker red. Could you do that? So, but maybe because that person had taken the time to build the trust that I have in them, that I know it comes from a good place. I know the feedback comes from a good place. All right, so that's giving effective guidance. It's also really important to give guidance immediately and give it in person. So let me give you an example. So I was sitting in a meeting, three other mentors, and Chris. Chris is the founder of a company, and he invited some, some mentors of his to sit in the meeting, and he was gonna go through, it was an hour-long meeting. And he spent the first 30 minutes just giving us a big, long, summary. And I'm sitting in the back of the room going, oh God, like, I hope he's going to ask these mentors for advice or tell us about his struggle at some point because he is just talking and talking and talking and talking. And I, I've got to tell him this. And at first I was like, okay, what can I do? I don't want to embarrass him. Maybe I'll send him a text message. I'll send him a text message. He'll still look at his phone and he'll see my feedback. So I get up my phone. I'm like, Shit, there's no service in here. Shit, okay. Crap. Okay, maybe I need to figure out how to say something. How can I do that? Give guidance immediately in person right now so the last 30 minutes can be effective. So what did I do? So you said on the previous slide, I kind of said, and be curious. So the question is like, how can I be curious and how can I make this about me and not about him? I could have spoken up and said, like, Chris, I, like, are you going to even, or do you even care about us, about us being here? No, that's the wrong way to say it. So let me, let me, how can I make this about me? So I spoke up and I said, hey, can I, I say something? I'm noticing right now that I'm, I'm a little frustrated because, you know, I, I, you've got some amazing mentors here and, and I want to be able to help you. And I, I, I just, I'm hoping that at some point you're going to, ask them questions soon where so we can in this room help you um, because I want to help you but it, right now it's kind of feeling like a one-way conversation to me and I'm glad I did the second I did <laughs> other people spoke up too another mentor in the room said I'm glad you said something you're right you know I'd like to figure out how we can help and Chris immediately switched and he said okay well yeah okay let me get to that and he immediately started talking about stuff he needed help with and the meeting was great I'll be showing you some more examples of that in a minute. Um, also, oh, what I wanted to say, one more thing here. So why, why is it important to be in person? Because we make up stories when we read our text messages and context is lost. When somebody's face to face with you, you can see how they're acting. You can see, you can hear their tone. And you're much more likely to be able to hear something that might be difficult for you but still know that someone cares because you trust them. All right, bad habits. Okay, another meeting. I'm sitting in a meeting with, <laughs> oh, this is a, I could tell you who this is and you'd know exactly who it is. 
in one of these things. I'm, should I? Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna do it just for fun. So I'm sitting in a meeting with Justin Mazel. Yes. And uh, it was a design product meeting. And Justin, you know, super smart guy, amazing guy, so much respect for him, he's a good friend of mine. But he's sitting there and he's on his phone. And he's there on his phone in a meeting. And I'm like, starting to be like, what, like, I'm starting noticing myself getting a little irritated that he's not focusing, he's not here, he's not with us. And so, okay, so why am I irritated? Let me take a step back. Why is this? I wrote on my little card here, I am a mystery to me. So there's the mystery. I'm irritated. Why am I irritated? What is the story I'm telling myself? And why is it important for me that he pay attention? And how can I say something right now that doesn't make me sound like an asshole? So I said something, and I realized what was important. I said, hey, I'm just noticing, you know, Justin, you know, your opinion here and what we're doing is really important to me. And, you know, I'm finding myself just a little distracted because I'm, I'm worried that you're not completely engaged here, and I really want to know what you think about this. And I'm just, just kind of just getting distracted because you're on your phone. But that's me. That's my story. And so sure enough, you know, he put the, put the phone down and got engaged. So notice I could, have, I could have said something like, could you please put down your phone? Oh, that would have been awful. Right? Instead, it's about telling, well, what's my experience? What's my story? So, and uh, yeah, it's important to deal with bad habits. And it's important to do that also. This is the hard part, which I'm still figuring out. It's important to do this not in private. I know I've often been guilty of this. I see somebody doing something or they speak up in a certain way that might be defensive and I go, I'm gonna talk to them later about this in, in, in private so they don't feel like I'm putting them on the spot. But what happens when you give somebody that feedback? What happens when I gave Justin that feedback why was it important that it was in front of other people? What did that do? It showed, what's that? Right, okay, it gave him accountability. Definitely, that's one thing. And it also showed everybody else what sort of behaviors I might expect. Or what, you know, what irritates me. Or, you know, so they all are thinking about that. Especially when it comes to bad habits that are like um, withholding, people aren't speaking up, or they're being defensive, or it's important to show people what you expect of them, what behaviors are okay. Um, I, so my, my own biggest bad habit is I have a tendency to interrupt people with my face. <laughs> you know, I'm talking with somebody or a group of people, and they say something, and in the meantime, I'm problem solving, and I come up with an idea, and I'm all like, And, you know, I, I got all excited because I have an idea, but somebody else is still talking, and I just interrupted them with my face. And now, what, 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 what is that communicating? I'm communicating to them so many awful things. Number one, they saw that. They recognized it. It was almost as bad as just interrupting them on the spot. And now they probably think Greg's not even listening because he's just waiting for his turn to talk. So I'm very much aware of that. And I even told my coworkers, like, I, I do that, and next time you see me doing that, please, please let me know, point that out, so that I don't do that again. And if anybody has any questions, by the way, feel free to, this can be a dialogue. So I know, as somebody who enjoys creating things, if I have too many meetings in my day, I, I don't like it. And I, after a while, you start not liking meetings. But meetings aren't in themselves bad. Bad meetings are bad. There's a million ways to run horrible meetings that are really boring and not very effective. Um, and there's lots of ways to run them better. What I like to do, and keep this in mind, if you're ever in a meeting where you feel kind of like bored at one point, you're probably not the only one, or you feel like it could have been run better, you're probably not the only one. What I try to do at the end of meetings where I feel like they weren't efficient is simply ask this question. Hey, hey, before we go, could we spend five minutes just talking about how we could run this meeting better next time? 
if anybody has any ideas. And I don't even say what I'm thinking, because usually somebody else says it before even I get a chance to. Because like I said, odds are you're not the only one. So there's always lots of ways. If you find yourself getting angry at a meeting, there's gonna be a way to make them better. Yeah. If I had a boss that, yeah, would it be offended if we sort of like, hey, can we run this better? Um, well, it's all about efficiency in business. The goal in business is to be more efficient. If you're more efficient, you can make more money. And so the way I would approach it is just say, hey, you know, it's really important to me that we're really efficient here so we can get stuff done, communicate the way we need to communicate, and so we can, you know, make more on the bottom line. And so maybe it's just sort of like asking a question. Would you be open to having a conversation about how we could improve meetings? Right. So you're opening the door. You can open the door for it. There's a lot to be said about asking permission before going there. You ask a question like, hey, I think I've got some ideas on how we can improve meetings. Are you in, you know, can we talk about that? Yeah. Well, it kind of depends on the boss. <laughs> I can see lots of situations where I'd, I'd, I'd kind of be afraid to do that in front of other people. Especially, what that means is that your boss is insecure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're worried about saying that in front of other people, odds are it's for a good reason, because you think him or her is going to get defensive, because deep down they think they're incompetent or um, are afraid of being unlikable. We all have those fears. Um, so if you think the nicer way to do it is to talk one-on-one -on -one first, definitely would we'll do that. Yeah. One, so, so one sort of just saying what you, just being out there and like, versus, versus, like the more versus more conservative. Well, people lead in different ways. I think the bottom line of being more effective, it has to do with openness. That's what's missing out of most of our work environments, is people having the, um, the trust and the courage to be open. We might talk about you know, it goes back to the, um, you know, you get three people in a meeting and we're all building something together. And, you know, one person is a little bit, you know, is the leader, we should do this and this is what we're going to do. And the other guy's, okay, yeah, let's, let's do it. Yeah, we all agree, right? And then, you know, the leader walks out of the room and, you know, the people there, one of them turns to the other and says, there's no fucking way this is going to work. And the other person goes, that's not my responsibility, I don't really care, right? So that's, that's withholding, that's withholding uh, openness. So you gotta be in the, you, gotta, you know, there's lots of ways to uh, foster environments where people have the courage to speak up and say, you know, I'm, I'm just confused, I don't, I don't really get it. Could we talk about it some more? I really wanna understand. So it's about, um, about hearts and minds, I guess. Openness means not only do I agree, but I believe. And there's lots of ways to get there, and some of them are more rash than others. But that whole idea of like, I'm just gonna say what I mean and be out there, that's also, a, it's also defensive. That's also not open either. When people are rash and they're just open all the time, and I'm just like, I'm just that way. That's also a defense. So it's about less defense is more openness and sort of both sides have their own defenses, they're just different defenses. Um, and I could talk about that, but I'm gonna move on. <laughs> I could talk more about that. Afterwards, if you wanna come talk more about that, I'd be happy to. Um, beware of your human tendencies to make up stories. So, what's a good example? So this is the, oh, let's see, I've got a personal example, but let's just say, let's say if I'm Justin, and I just heard, you know, the leader of the company confront me about my cell phone use, what might I, what might go through my head? I might do like, oh man, he's such an asshole, like he doesn't even care about me, and probably thinks I'm just incompetent, and blah, 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 so story, 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 story. That's defensiveness, right? Stories get make up, made up on this side. 
where we're working with somebody and we don't believe they care about us. It's also where we get defenses. So take a look at this list. I'm sure I do all of them at some point. So like with Justin, I, you know, Justin could have taken offense to that. Um, I know it's sometimes when somebody, when I work really hard on something and I put it in front of them and they do anything less than think it's amazing, I might, well, what the fuck do they know anyway? They don't know this. They're not a developer, they're not a designer. They don't even know, right? So that's, that's defensiveness. And so learning more about the mystery of yourself is about starting to recognize those stories that you tell yourself and understand when you're getting defensive so that you can make a choice. So this is a big one for everybody in this room. So start recognizing when we start getting defensive, when we start feeling like somebody doesn't even care about us, and trying to put ourselves in a, think about the right question to ask to get curious. So I can think of lots of situations where I wish I would have behaved differently. The boss says, hey Greg, you're working on the wrong thing. Why aren't you working on this? Now in my mind I'm going, God, he's such an asshole, doesn't even care about blah, blah, blah. Um, but instead I go, okay, wait, how can I get curious about this? Hey, hey, hey Tim, can I ask you a question about, about this project you gave me last, last Thursday? That's, so the asking thing. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Well, um, on Thursday you made this sound like it was really important, but right now I'm hearing that I'm, you don't think I'm working on the right thing. What changed? Like, oh yeah, um, I, I should have talked to you on Friday about this. This whole thing changed and yeah. So it's just about getting curious, stopping those stories. Um, right, okay, next thing. So this is all about putting people first. Conflict, conflict resolution. This also goes really badly in most organizations. Um, and the example I have here is something around, revolving around something called tri triangulation, which we tried to kill at code school. So what is that? So I say side to side before it's top down. So I have a senior developer come to me and says, hey, you know, in private, and he says, uh, I'll, I'll play him. Hey, uh, Greg, um, I keep on walking by uh, Tim's desk and I see that he's got you know, he's working on this and he's on Facebook and he's on chat and he's posting memes and all this and I'm worried that in, like, he's not even working. And I'm like, and, and, uh, okay, what are, you, what are you worried about? What's the, what, you know, what, what, what's the concern? What's your concern? I'm worried that he's not going to finish the deadline on Friday and that's pretty important. Okay, could you please tell him that? So with an open environment where people can be open, where everybody can communicate with everybody, communication needs to happen and it cannot be triangulated. The moment that somebody walks out of that meeting and one person turns to the other and goes, Greg is such an asshole and blah, 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 and him that, him that, like, the, ooh, it's a toxic, it's very toxic when you start talking about other people, even if you think you're being constructive. So we employed this at Code School, um, no triangulation. So if you go to any of the managers or anybody and start talking about something you don't like about somebody else or any sort of critique, it's that manager's job to say, hey, that, okay, appreciate you telling me. I would really love it if you went and told them yourself. So that sort of conflict resolution has to be side to side. You should be in an environment where you feel comfortable enough to give feedback to your peers. And what could that sound like? So if I coach that senior developer and he goes to Tim who's on social media, what would that sound like? That could sound something like, hey Tim, I'm, I'm noticing myself getting a little worried that we're not gonna reach that Friday deadline and when I walk by your desk, I notice, I can't help but noticing that you're not working on it and I'm afraid that we're not gonna make that deadline. Um, how are you, how are, how's it going? And for all we know, Tim might be like, yeah, dude, I worked till like midnight the last couple nights. I totally got it done. You got nothing to worry about. Oh, okay. Cool. Also, um, as an engineer, I, when people come to me with problems, I often like to try to solve them. <laughs> 
And sometimes that's the absolute thing they do not want me to do. That's not what they're looking for, and it's also not what it means to be a good coach. Who is the best person to solve your problems? Right, it's not somebody else, it's not somebody who you know, can give you, tell you what to do, it's you. So the best thing that I can do as a coach when someone comes to me with a problem is help them figure out what they probably already know. They probably already have some idea of how they might solve it. So I can say something like, well, what are you thinking? What do you wanna, how do you think? Um, so it's really all about asking questions. Have you, have you solved this problem before? How did we, how did we solve this problem before? Um, did it work? Okay. How can we improve on that? Okay, when do you think, when do you think, how quickly will that get done? Are you gonna need any help with that? It's all about asking questions, rather than immediately jumping to, well, here's how I think you should do it. Um, there's this great question, when all, and it's not, that's not the question, that's just an image, but, um, and this is really good for interpersonal relationships as well, if, you're, if you've got a significant other, pay attention for a minute. Um, when you reach that point with somebody where you're not sure what to do, or you're not sure how to help, or even if they want you to help, there's one question that I always keep in mind. What would be most helpful to you right now? Not what can I do for you? How self-centered am I to think that I'm the one that can solve your problems? But what would be most helpful to you right now? The answer might be, I need another day in the week. So the next time you have a significant other and they're just all frustrated and blah, and you feel like you wanna do something for them, but you don't know what. What would be most helpful to you right now? Also, when it comes to mentoring people, this question's really good, right? So that goes along with asking questions again, is somebody comes to me with a problem, I need to do this, I'm not too sure how to reach this. Okay, well, what do you think? And then they go, I really don't know. And then you go, well, make something up. <laughs> That is the most fun question ever, by the way. I'm really enjoying this question. When the next time you hear somebody say, I don't know, whether it's the boss or like when they say, you know, I don't know, I don't have this job, and I don't like it, I don't know what to do. And you go, well, well, what if you had to just make something up? What would you do? I don't know, I'd probably look for another job. Cool. You know, so people will be open when you, I'll leave them. When you say, just make something up, what, what, what do you think? Make something up. And all of a sudden, people will get a lot more creative than you thought. And usually, they'll tell you exactly the right solution to the right problem. You know, uh, it's crazy. Because they know. They just, for some reason, are reluctant to speak up and get it out there. All right. Take a look at this statement. And in your head, I want you to put something in the blank for you. So this is something called a fixed mindset. Who here has heard about fixed versus growth mindsets? A couple of you? Awesome. So a fixed mindset believes that our talent is limited. That no matter how hard I work on something, there's, I just can't get any better on that. Like, oh, I'm just horrible at remembering people's names. I'm just not good at marketing. I'm just not good at talking to my boss and being open. A growth mindset believes the opposite of that, which is that if I set my mind to it, I can get good and better at anything, which is just the truth. If I really care enough about something, I can get better at that. We all have fixed mindsets about things. Many of them are unconscious. I'm a mystery. There are some things that I have a fixed mindset I don't even realize I have a fixed mindset on. Um, so there's one way that you can change this from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, and that is by adding the word yet. Oh, yeah. So all these things, whether it's when it comes to work, I'm just not very good at planning yet. That's something that if I choose to put the time into, I can. 
And this goes back to the beginning where I, I said something like, I'm just not good at this. I'm just not good. This is a less fixed mindset. Or, I, oh, the worst is, oh, I'm just that way. That's just how I am. That's just bullshit. So, like, there's a CEO, a local CEO of a company. He says, you know, he's late to the meeting. I go, well, I'm noticing that I, you're, you're not on time very often. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's how I am. You know what that's really saying? That's saying, I really just don't care about you enough to be on time and about the way that makes me look. I just don't care to put enough effort into it. That's what that really says. So, yeah, be careful about that. All right, I've seen people like that. People like, you know, Gary Vee and those of you that's just like, they're big, loud personalities and they piss people off sometimes. And they go, it's just my personality. Oh, that's just bullshit. You know, that's them being defensive. They're loud and obnoxious and often can put people off because they don't give enough of a fuck about people. They don't care enough about it. Or really what it is, is they're there's, it's all based around insecurity. They're big, loud, and obnoxious because they're guarding against feeling something that they don't want to feel. So that's growth. Um, so you can modify your thinking. If you can recognize where you feel fixed, where you feel like, ah, I just don't want to do that. I'm not good at that. If I do that, I won't be good at that. Like, scrub that from your head. Modify your thinking. You could get good at that. You could get good at being more open, and if you chose to, you can choose. There's this great quote by Henry Ford, um, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So if you have a fixed mindset about something, well, maybe, maybe, you won't, maybe you'll fail, yeah, because you'll, you'll think your talent's limited anyway. How are you going to feel when people give you feedback about something that you're fixed on? It's going to feel like shit. Because you're just like, ah, yeah, yep, that's just confirming my fears that I'm not good at this and I don't, I don't want to hear it. Another way you can get more growth and even create an atmosphere of growth in your company is change the way you give compliments. So whereas, wow, you're a master at this, that's actually kind of a fixed compliment. So how, how might you change that? How you change it is you, it's more about the effort than it is about the end result. So, wow, I can tell you worked really hard on this. That's more growth. Or you finished, finished product, you created was perfect. If I tell you, wow, it was perfect, what are you going to try to do next time? Make it perfect. And if I don't say it's perfect, it's not going to make you feel good because that's what you're striving for. So that's fixed. It's obvious you put a lot of effort into this. That's complementing the effort rather than the um, accomplishment. The design you created was impressive versus you obviously put a lot of work into the design. I can see that. So this, if you have kids or you're around kids, this is even more important, this whole growth versus fixed thing. They've done studies that have shown that kids that are complemented in a way that is fixed, wow, you got an A on that test. You are, you, you did perfectly. You are so perfect. I, you got an A at 100%. Wow, you got 100%. So those kids that get complemented in that way, what's going to happen when they don't get 100%? Ugh, right? So they don't actually don't try as hard the next time. There's studies, they did this. They don't try as hard on subsequent tests if they are just complemented in a way that designates fixed. So rather than, wow, you got an A, you must have really studied hard. It's very different. The other thing that, okay, we're reaching towards the end of the talk. Um, one thing that I'm not good at yet is celebrating and appreciating. That's the other thing that you can do to put people first, build that trust so that you can be open with them. And that could be things like when a product gets finished, hey, we're going to all go out for drinks. Let's all go celebrate. Or um, bringing people cards for their birthdays or celebrating their work anniversaries. Just noticing, celebrating them, appreciating people. That's a really great way to put people first and build that trust. So back at the beginning of the talk, we talked about how 
I started with what would be your optimal work environment. I didn't realize it then, but what I was doing was sort of painting a vision. And it's really important to do this too, and that you're in an office environment that does this. And I know I, I couldn't get it. I didn't get this until I heard one podcaster one day explain, okay, painting a vision is really simple. All you gotta do is think about what do you want things to look like in five years? Five years from now, in a perfect world, what do you want things to look like? Well, okay, let's all get together and think about that. I want it to do this and have this amazing office environment and be on the 20th floor and have amazing clients, blah, blah, blah. That's your vision. That's painting your vision. That's when you go to people and say, hey, you know, uh, you should be a part of this company and this is where we're going and we want it to look like this in five years. That's all it is, is painting a vision. Why is that important? Once you have a vision, you can move from vision to aim. So an aim is a quick statement that designates where, how you're going to get to your vision, how you're going to reach that destination. I was, and, and there's lots of, all sorts of ways to reach the same destination. I was talking to Christine who runs Orlando Food Lab, pretty awesome if you're a foodie, and uh, I asked this question, I was like, okay, you, you want to, she has a very clear vision of where she wants to make Orlando this amazing foodie place with lots of uh, food entrepreneurs and food trucks, and she has the vision. And I was like, okay, well, but I was like, what, what is your aim? How are you gonna do that? And she leaned off a bunch of them. And I said, okay, well, wait, 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 wait. I can see, I see two different ways you could reach to that point five years from now. You could either find the foodies, the consumers, and bring them to all the small businesses and chefs and restaurants and build it that way. Or you could put on events and teach the actual food entrepreneurs how to be more successful. That could be your aim, or that could be your aim, but it could go to the same destination. But what you would do to reach that aim are gonna be very different things. Just to give you some examples of like uh, Pluralsight's aim, at least eight months ago, was uh, democratize professional technology learning. Code School's aim, enliven the learning of new technologies. So even where two different companies, um, well, same company, but under the same banner, um, enliven means you know, to be more effective, more entertaining. And now that we know our aim, we can make sure that everything that we do when we plan our company, when we plan our goals, are heading in that direction, right? So it shows you where to steer. So as we build our business and we have lots of opportunities, lots of islands we could land on on our way to our vision, we can decide, okay, we could build that feature, but would it help us get more there? Or is it just virtual reality, augmented reality, buzz, buzz, buzz? <laughs> No, it's not gonna help us with our aim. Um, why is an aim important? An aim's important so you can set goals. Once you know how you're gonna get to your vision, you can set goals. So here are some of Code School's goals, in case you want some examples of this. These were our yearly goals for um, maybe two years ago. And so, you know, we spent probably a half a day refining our aim, and then another half a day figuring out how to get there, what are the big year-long goals. And once you have these, we broke them out into quarterly goals and so on. You might be asking at this point, <laughs> have I derailed? This is all about people. Why am I talking about vision and goals and aims? But what happens when you're on a team of people, if let's say you know, five, 10, 15 people, and people don't know where you're trying to go, and not everybody has the same idea with where you're trying to sail the ship. Do those people act like they're on the same team? Probably not. So the best thing you can do is make sure everybody in your team not only understands the aim and where you're headed, but the why, and they get it. Because when it comes down to it, like, I'm motivated by doing meaningful work. That's what motivates me, to do it well. That's what hopefully motivates every individual person in your company, is like, this is why the work we're doing is worthwhile, because we see the vision, we wanna get to this point, and this is how we're getting there. Does that make, yeah, that makes sense? That's what I'd ask them too, does that make sense? All right.
So that's almost the end. If you take one thing away from my talk, <laughs> it's make sure you're doing these. If you're not doing these, and you're not being listened to, or listening to the people around you, you need to be. Um, if you take four things away from my talk, strive to give effective guidance, direct guidance, not compliment sandwiches, but direct guidance. Um, instead of getting, when you sense yourself getting defensive about something, not liking it for some reason, take a step back and go, what's the story? What's my story? And may, am I making this up? Am I, is this person really not appreciative of my work? Am I telling myself that story? And how can I get curious about that to see if this is true? What question can I ask? Um, strive for a growth mindset, paint a vision and aim. Um, before I do any uh, last minute questions, um, oh, if you like my style, you want to learn more about entrepreneurship and like sort of the, what I learned along the way building the businesses, if you ever want to build your own. If you Google Greg Pollock Founders Talks, I've got three talks where I kind of do the same sort of thing and talk about all the ways that I failed along the way. Um, we're also raising money, I've got to say this too. Um, there's four organizations that I'm help uh, from Canvas, the co-working space. I created a tech accelerator called Starter Studio. It's a three-month tech accelerator. If you ever you know, want to build your own business, definitely take a look there. We have tons of free events, so that's Starter Studio. Firespring Fund is if you graduate from Starter Studio and you need funding, we can help you get funding. And then, of course, the Orlando Tech Association, which is getting better. It's getting better. Come on, guys. <laughs> I'm working with them to make sure that they are empowering the tech community better than they ever have before. There are things to come. But you, all these organizations are nonprofits, which means you know, they, they, they don't make money. Um, and so in order to be effective, they need to have staffing. And they have like one or two, they all have one, at least one employee. So in order to uh, pay those people, we always have to be raising sponsorships. And this time or this year, I figured, why not all try to raise all the money we need for the year all at once, rather than asking lots of sponsors all throughout the year and competing for sponsors. So that's what this is about, orlandotechcommunity.com. If you have a, if you work for a business that relies on employing talented people in Orlando, then maybe consider throwing this to your boss and saying, hey, throw a thousand in here because we care about the tech community. Appreciate it, thank you. Um, I have a blog, gregpollock.com. We blog occasionally. Um, the next thing I'm working on, because I don't work for Code School or Envy Labs anymore, I'm starting to produce some more content. And it starts with this open source craft. Um, I'm interviewing people who create popular open source projects and figuring out what works and what didn't work and getting their stories. So that's what I'm up to. You'll probably see more about that. Um, if you want to get more involved with the tech community, I also run a newsletter. It goes out once a month that tells you all about the tech events and the goes that are going around the town. That's at techevents.us. Check that out if you want to get more involved. Um, a lot of the shit that I learned from this came from working with um, some organizational psychologists, which I brought into the company, which helped with culture and um, coaching and survey work and succession management. I could go on. Um, but I've been really getting fascinated about organizational psychology. So check out Key Talent Solutions, local company. Um, and they're running some. Oh, yeah, I screwed up that URL. No, I got it right. I got it right. Um, if you're interested, if you're the kind of person that really enjoys psychology and are interested in the psychology of organizations, um, there's an event coming up on February 8th run by Key Talent Solutions um, called the Human Element Evening, which we're going over, uh, uh, were, no, Laura and Gabriella are going over this giving you a small taste of this week-long workshop that they're running in March, which is all about creating more open and trusting work environments. Um, yeah, at Creative Commons, all that. And uh, we are all now friends, by the way. So you're welcome to add me to LinkedIn. But by being friends, what you're also doing is you're giving me permission to add you to my mailing list. So you can be my friend, but that's the, that's the feature. That's, that's, that's what you get, because I'll send you useful information that you'll love. Any questions? I'll let you go. We've got like six minutes.
So as a manager, I have one-on-one -on -one with my people, but nobody above me does that back down. Like, so I just ask. I guess I could just ask, huh? Yeah, so yeah. Is that weird? So I think it's important, yeah. So it's it's important that uh, that you get that yourself. And if you're a boss, if you're the boss, you can, you know, it's whoever whoever's your number two, whoever your number two is, I think needs to have that with you. So you need to you need to be able to be open with at least you know really open with someone in the company, and that's where they come in to ask you questions with the goal of getting you to speak up about all the stuff that's going on in your mind. That would be one way to do it. Another way to do it um, would be to get a leadership coach. All right, so that's, a, that's exactly what uh, Key Talent Solutions does, is get somebody who can help you be really effective, which is what I did. Um, but like the last two years of code school, Key Talent Solutions helped me out with so much just because um, they're just really effective coaches. And often, as a leader, sometimes you end up with information that like doesn't, like, only, if you share it with anybody, it only serves to demoralize people. And it's like pointless to vent to anyone because it's just going to demoralize people. And who knows if it's your own story or whatever, you're frustrated with something. You need to have somebody you can go to and just be completely fucking open with. So that's why it's important to have like a, a coach, I think. I would always have one from now on. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Of the, it's like Jill Cook or something? I think if you just Google radical transparency Google, her talk will come up. It's a really great talk and kind of goes into that principle more. Yeah. Um, I think like clients that deal with people that are like too much of a like, What do you mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um, yeah, you'll definitely, I've definitely worked with people who just have a tendency not to speak up in groups, even though they'll have lots of, uh, they have lots of things to add. And that could be for lots of different reasons. People withhold when they are afraid of not being likable. So there's, if you get into, if you get into this stuff that I've been to, there's, there's, Categories. So this is likability. So that's one reason why people don't speak up and people get defensive, is because deep down, and we all have this fear deep down, where we're all afraid that we're not likable. So I'm afraid that I'm not likable. And if I'm really afraid of not being likable, and I go into a meeting with other people, and I don't like somebody else's work, how likely am I going to, to speak up if I'm afraid that it might make me unlikable if I tell them I don't like their project? The problem with that is I might be a domain expert on it. I might be the best person in the room to qualify what's good or not. But because I'm afraid that I might not be likable, I'm not speaking up. Or it could be about competence. It's really important for me to appear competent. And if I don't speak up, no one's going to be able to tell me I'm wrong and my idea is bad. So I'm not going to. There's reason. So I find, and this is just my experience, I find that when people aren't speaking up and contributing, there's usually um, some, something preventing them from doing that. It could come from an insecurity, it could come from a pre different preconceived notion. So what I do in those cases is I'm very mindful, like even personally, when I'm in a room collaborating with people of who hasn't spoken up and leaving space for them. So even if you're not the boss, um, in some meetings, uh, yeah, I, I'm with other people and someone else is leading. But if I notice that somebody's not speaking up, I'll go out of my way to say, hey, Tim, what do you think? Um, so I think you can prompt them for that. That's one way you can do that. You can also leave white space. Sometimes the people who you want to speak up don't because they don't feel like and they need that space. They need somebody to ask, anybody else have any thoughts? And then you count to five. <laughs> Slowly. Because only once you leave them space do they speak up. I hope that helps. I don't know. We can talk more about it if you want. But um, at least that's my experience with people who are too much of team players. Odds are there's, they, have, they have something to contribute. They have feelings. They feel about things. They might like other people's ideas. But they at least need to speak up and say, I like 
Greg's idea because X, Y, and Z, and there's a reason they're not speaking what they're thinking. Yeah. One more? Yeah. What, anything specifically that you want to affect? Um, I guess more specifically, you know, giving feedback to other, you know, departments that are like uh, in the maybe not as willing to hear it. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, fostering that openness. Yeah, so when you, when you give someone feedback and you feel that wall, um, like, it, so it's in my opinion, in my experience, when I've seen that in my office or I've, you know, I've experienced that myself. I, I attribute it to lack of trust. And so I'll ask myself, what can I do to build more trust in this person? So that feedback didn't go too well. Maybe I'm gonna ask them to lunch. And I'll go to lunch with that person, and I'll just, we won't talk about work, and I'll, I'll try to be open with them, and try to be vulnerable. But the, the trick about that is you have to go first. That's the hard part, right? I, uh, I find myself, if I go to lunch with somebody and they just keep it small talk, weather, job, blah, 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 like, I can't, after a while I can't take it. But I want to have a more deep, meaningful conversation with them. But I realize, like, that means I have to go first. So what can I share to be more open? Yeah, you know, that pro you know, it could be about work, you know. Uh, I, I was just, maybe, and maybe it's about something about getting feedback, even, to show them that you're vulnerable too. Like, you know, I have a really, I have a really, I, I seem to struggle with getting feedback about something when it's in this particular area that I don't think I'm very good at. And, um, yeah, and that's, that sucked. I've been working on that lately. Does that resonate with you at all? Right. And to see where they go from there. So it's about being open, building those relationships so that you can give people more direct feedback and they trust that it's coming from a place of caring rather than criticism. That's one idea. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming.